If I know you, you love elephants. Who doesn't have a special place in their heart for these big, unlikely looking, highly intelligent, trunk bearing creatures? And who isn't moved by the outrages of poaching and predation? Bad people. That's who. As a neuroscience person, I can't help but admire the large, complex brains of these animals. And like us, they're large, long-lived, and social. But this isn't going to be about how great elephants are and how interesting their behavior, nor about our anthropomorphic appropriation of the elephant and his mud pond splashing ways. Note my own childhood stuffed elephant. No, what I want to tell you about are new developments in elephant history. Elephant history, there's something strange sounding about that. After all, we Recorded human history became possible with the invention of writing about 5,000 years ago, after which stories, culture, and religion could be recorded more reliably. So when did elephants begin to preserve their history? Well, elephants can't write, and as far as we know, they don't have language like ours. While their sensitive trunks probably could hold a stylus, they are not starting to press meaning into clay tablets or to operate primitive computers. But what they can do is leave us their DNA, and that's where I'm going with this. There is a revolution going on in the use of current and ancient DNA to answer previously unanswerable questions about life on Earth. And when it comes to the elephant, this would be called elephant paleogenetics. Elephants are very isolated creatures in that they haven't left many living cousins. There are extinct close relations, but the nearest living relatives are the sea cow and the manatee from which they separated tens of millions of years ago. How many living species of elephants are there? If you said two, the Asian elephant and the African elephant, you'd be wrong, but you'd be in good company because many people don't know about the third elephant. For many years, the smaller African forest elephant, which occupies parts of West Central Africa, was thought to be a member of the same species as the more numerous and widespread African savanna elephant. But recent research has shown that these groups are quite genetically distinct, having separated perhaps two million years ago and having been almost completely genetically isolated for the last half million years and the range of the forest elephant was once much wider than it is today within Africa. The Asian elephant originated within Africa and migrated into Eurasia maybe two million years ago or so and became extinct within Africa. So its ancestors lived in Africa, but its current populations are in India, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and even Borneo. So there's a general principle. Current occupancy is not a reliable measure of past location. Consider the camel. Surprisingly, the ancestors of the camel originated in northern North America, and only later did subsequent descendant species cross a land bridge into South America to become llamas, and cross the Bering Land Bridge to become the two-humped Bactrian camel and the familiar dromedary camel of the Middle East and North Africa. That's a long way from North America. Back to the elephant. Now I know what you're thinking, because I'd be up in arms too. You talked about elephants, but where do mammoths fit in? And what about mastodons? That's opening up a whole can of worms. If I tried to explain it thoroughly, we'd both regret it because it's complicated and while progress is being made as far as I know in July of 2018 it's not fully resolved. In fact when I looked into the current understanding of this about a year ago the received opinion and even breaking news was different. So part of me would rather not even get into the question of paleo elephants and yet of course in any conversation about elephant taxonomy it's the most reasonable question to ask. What about mammoths? I'll tell you broadly what my reading of the data reveals and if you want more in the notes, I'll send you down the same rabbit hole that I went down. It's fair to say that this is a developing story. First, let's dispense with mastodons by acknowledging that mastodons are not members of the Elephantidae family, which evolved in Africa maybe six million years ago. Despite some similarities in appearance, the ancestors of the mastodon diverged from the deep ancestors of the mammoths and elephants many million years before that. There were numerous species of paleo elephants in Africa and in Eurasia, including including the straight-tusked elephant that was especially abundant in Europe, including the famous woolly mammoth of northern Eurasia and northern North America, and the Colombian mammoth with a more southerly range in the Americas, comprising most of the continental U.S. and maybe as far south as Costa Rica, to name only a few. The woolly mammoth was very well adapted to cold and held out in small numbers in remote Arctic refugia until about 4,000 years ago. They appear to be more closely related to Asian elephants than to African elephants. Here's what 
what's important about this since the details are changing. Elephant history is one both of isolation of groups, as in the two species of African elephant, and of mixing. The extinct straight-tusked elephant, which occupied Europe and parts of Western Asia from maybe 700,000 years ago until 50,000 years ago, has now been discovered to carry genetic contributions from at least three different other elephant groups. The African forest elephant, the common ancestor of African elephants, and a species related to mammoths and Asian elephants. Connect that piece of information to what I said before about the limited range of the African forest elephant not always having been so restricted. One wonders where geographically this mixing occurred to produce the straight tusked elephant. But this kind of mixing is seen in other elephant groups too. The woolly mammoth and the Colombian mammoth also interbred at the overlaps of their ranges. All very interesting. Why am I telling you this? Well, it's partly because elephants are inherently interesting, but I'm also getting to something even more interesting to me, human paleogenetics. I'm not really going to tell you about it now, but just as genetics has been used to reveal the past habitats and migratory history of elephants, there is a revolution going on in human paleogenetics. Questions that have been unanswered for years suddenly have answers, and I'll be talking about this in future videos. Here are two principles that illustrate what I'm going to be talking about. Like elephants, present human occupancy is not a reliable guide to the past geographic locations of populations. And second, like elephant history, human history is one of the persistent mixing of groups and populations. While these general principles are not new, they're being newly and vividly illuminated by the emerging field of paleogenetics. The ability to compare the DNA in our bodies and the DNA in the bones of ancient human ancestors is now answering questions about the distant human past well before we had written language and is even revealing new facts about our very origins as a species. I've pondered these questions for most of my life and my reaction to the emerging paleogenetics is one of awe. I almost can't believe that suddenly, over the last few years and in my lifetime, we now have newer, clearer answers to questions of human origins and human migrations and human history well before civilizations, some of which either overturn previous beliefs or are driving major revisions. Stay tuned and don't buy ivory. Be sure to subscribe and thanks a lot for watching.